Hello and welcome to the Undressing the Spirit podcast, where sex and spirit go hand in hand. Join me, Tamara Powell, on a no-holds-barred adventure into the psyche and beyond every conceivable limit. Welcome back to Undressing the Spirit. If you haven't noticed already, my voice is a little bit under the weather this week, but this conversation was so good, I had to release it as soon as possible. My guest today is Stacy Steinmiller. She's a licensed clinical social worker who owns her own practice called Authentic Self Counseling. How good is that? It's located in Rochester, New York. Stacy's passionate about helping adults move past the bullshit in their life that they feel is keeping them from their true potential. Hallelujah. Stacy loves to dive deep with her clients and get to the root of the issues so that the same emotional and behavior things don't just keep resurfacing over and over again. Her big dreams are to change the world via a ripple effect of kindness to a more compassionate, peaceful, loving, and connectful field world. What I love most about Stacey is probably her willingness to go there, to go all the wares. She let me put her on the hot seat, and we really explored trauma in a way that I don't think most of y'all have ever heard before. You see, she is not your regular trauma therapist. Oh, no. She is the type that will get down in the shit with you, normalize your experience, and empower you out of it. And if you are the type that is walking around thinking that you have no reason to feel the way that you are because your life hasn't been all that bad, well, sweetie, I got news for you. This conversation is for you. And I cannot wait for you to be challenged and inspired by the incredible, the incomparable Stacy Steinmiller. Hey, Stacy. Hey, Tamara. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for being here. You know, before we started this this morning, I was totally like uh, stalking you on the internet. And because, you know, as all good podcasters do. And I have to tell you how utterly in love I am with your website, first of all. It just has to be said. Well, thank you. I'm actually having it redone, but some of the content will be the same. Yes, but it is in the, I mean, I know it's been a progress, a work in progress, but oh my God, I love how real it is. Your video is amazing and your homepage, like I just, I'm like, fuck, I wish I'd written that myself. (laughs) I don't say that often. It's so good. The fact that your first line is shit happens in life and it doesn't make sense. You know, (laughs) just I'm fangirling over here. I love it. And It has really connected with my clients. And honestly, that's the number one thing people say when I ask, like, you know, what resonated with you? Because I'm usually trying to get an idea of what brought them in and why they're seeing me. And they're like, I think you're the therapist that said shit happens on your (laughs) plate, right? Yeah, they're like, yeah, that's why I called you. (laughs) I've had that feedback so much. It's insane. I get very similar feedback. I think that's why I resonate with you so strongly and why I'm over here fangirling with my pom-poms. Like, yes, thank God I'm not the only other trapezoid therapist out there. Yes. Yeah. And it's really grateful. I think Clay Cockrell says our our profession just takes itself too seriously. You know, I talked about that before. So it's just so nice to like, can we just, you know, cut through the bullshit and talk real person to person? Yes. Yes. Uh, Yeah, definitely. And that's one thing I've always felt that I had to give to the world. But when I was working in an agency, I felt stifled in it. And um, so being in private practice and meeting people like you that are stepping into it has really helped my confidence to be able to write those things on my website and be real. So I love that you love my website. But you also have been an influence to help (laughs) me do that and allow myself to do that. So thank you. 
And I love that you're seeing, this isn't what we're going to talk about today, but I, it should be said because it's helpful for everybody living whatever lifestyle that they are and whatever um, job description that they're in. I think it's important that to get okay with being authentic. I mean, it's literally the name of your counseling practice, right. authentic self-counseling, <laughs> and being able to see the return on investment of of your authenticity that when you put it out there, it literally attracts your right tribe to you. Definitely. And I thought it was too crazy to be true, but I'm finding that it is true. (laughs) (laughs) I have tested it myself over and over. I don't think it gets easier right away. It's just something that takes continual, continual practice. Yes. So you, my dear, are a fabulous trauma therapist and you do so much more than that but what I love about you is that you make trauma those scary things the shit happening in life so accessible do you know what I mean yes yes and you know and I told you before and yeah I identify as a trauma therapist and I also don't like to use that word a lot so that's why I use shit happens instead because people resonate with shit happening because there's something about the word trauma that people like Oh, wait, no. Well, that wasn't really tra- <laughs> oh, well, that wasn't traumatic. I don't think. No. <laughs> so, yeah. But yeah, I wanted to throw that in there. <laughs> I love that because I, I think so many times, you know, whether we're talking to clients or colleagues or friends, they minimize their own pain. Very much so. Yes. They don't realize that hard is hard. Right. And so what I do a lot of is normalizing and helping people to realize that they're, they are normal and it's a normal reaction. So when like, when shit happens in your life and things start to fall apart, that, that actually is a normal reaction. And when people, I usually say things like, well, if you didn't feel like that, I would be more concerned (laughs) because If you didn't care about whatever would mean that you're literally a psychopath and have no emotion or empathy or feelings or whatever. So um, I think, yeah, so I see it as more, this is a normal reaction to horrendous things that can happen in life. And some are really horrendous. Some aren't as horrendous, but we still have strong emotional reactions because it usually means there's a fear or something deeper going on underneath all of it. Yeah. So for our listeners, let's unpack that a little bit further. There is there is a difference between big T traumas and little T traumas. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, very much so. <laughs> <laughs> and so what are some of the more common issues that you see pop up in your clients that they probably have no idea that are affecting them as badly as they are? Yes. So, um, and that's the stuff that takes a little bit longer because it's it's hard to become aware and admit that those things are a problem. And I, and I think you talked about this, you probably talked about it multiple times on the podcast, but I remember specifically you talking about it with one of your guests. And I was just like, yes, 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 yes. And I think you were talking about um, going to therapy and unpacking, unpacking all the shit and unpacking what would, what did I really need in those moments? And it's scary to say what you would have really needed in those moments. Cause then we think, oh, I'm saying, I well, my mom, I had a good mom, so I can't say that I needed something different, or I had a good dad, I can't say that I needed something different, when that's not true. So, Girl, yes, you wrote a great blog on that. Keep going. Tell me more about that. Yeah, and so it's, it's getting to a place to be able to, and that's what, like, knowing yourself and really knowing what you needed, what you wanted. So that you also now in present moment can easily say, this is what I need. This is what I want. So that people can respond to you in the way that's most healing and helpful. So if we hide behind, well, my parents were great and they did everything perfect. Well, that's just a lie too, because nobody's perfect. So that's Mm -hmm. not possible. So it's being okay with getting to that uncomfortable place of, knowing that things weren't perfect, and that's okay too, but diving deep into knowing what didn't sit well with you, what would have been helpful, and how to then translate that knowledge into present day. 
Oh, yes. We could talk about this for hours, I swear, because there are so many women and men right now walking around in a state of disillusionment and not understanding why. Yes. And not being able to put not being able to put voice to, I can still love, honor, respect everyone in my life, parents, lovers, business partners, and hold space for my own experiences. Like, why the fuck are we not talking about this as a society? God. It's like fading away. Yeah, it's something you don't talk about. And I think, especially in our society of, you just don't talk about it. So we... So then, so it isn't in our awareness that these things could still be popping up because we wouldn't think of that because no one told us. And so those are the things that I really get into with my clients that kind of helps them make sense of stuff. And then it takes the shame away. It's like, oh, that's why I get really worked up whenever my spouse, blah, 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 or whatever. And so it's non-judgmental and it's not blaming mom, dad, caregiver, brother, sister, whoever that, you know, either it's like, oh, oh, it's just, that's just how things happen. And now you have the awareness and when you have the awareness and you can make changes to it. And I have found in my own life that it is actually a corrective emotional experience. It takes away the shame. It is very loving to say, my parents, my lover, my children, whoever are doing the best that they can with whatever that they have with their own experience, their own history, their own context, their own preferences. And it doesn't have to match mine. What a fucking phenomenal gift. I just get so excited about that topic. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, because yes. then it's the whole, it's their shit, not mine, you know? Yes, and, and it's okay that they have their right, shit. because we all have it. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God. Yes. Yes. I've actually found it to um, take away some of the mommy guilt that I feel. You're a mom now yeah. to two small young women. Oh and I'm a mom to two daughters who I swear to God are testing my ever-loving patience as a parent in the teen years. <laughs> Besides potty training, this is now the hardest thing we've ever had to go through together as a collective is puberty. Oh. So just warning you, buckle up. Buttercup. Yeah, and the potty training phase now. So <laughs> Bless you. it. I am holding your hand virtually. That was the my other least favorite parental activity to date. But even then... In potty training and also now in puberty, the shame, the mommy guilt that can pop up of going, I'm having a reaction to my child. Mm. Her needs do not perfectly align with my motherhood expectations. (laughs) Yes. Yes. She won't. For example, my oldest one, she has this like Instagram um, hashtag campaign of hashtag therapist kid. (laughs) (laughs) She (laughs) She does not want me to process her feels with her and it just kills me someday. (laughs) Um, But what you were talking about is was so freeing. And I have to remind myself of that every day that it is okay if I am not able to give her everything that she needs. I mean, it it slays me. I'm not going to lie. I still go to bed crying some nights going, oh, my God, why can I not give her everything that she needs? But I think there's part of, you know, existential growth and purpose and transformation that happens when each individual soul has to dig deep and identify it like you were just saying, identify it moment by moment and then put it out there. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I think you're right with, you know, having a kid, I really learned my, we can talk about window of tolerance of emotion, which I thought, yes. <laughs> I thought was pretty wide. And I'm like, oh, I guess it's about to get wider <laughs> if I work on this. Um, so really testing those limits on what makes me uncomfortable. What, like, why am I getting mad about this? Or why am I getting anxious about this? It's because I'm not tolerating her emotional state. It's not she shouldn't be having the emotional state. It's, oh, Stace, you need to look at yourself and you do what you need to do to tolerate this emotional state. So this working on your anxiety, your anger, your sadness, and what's going on. Mm. <laughs> and instantly I'm like, oh, so right. I don't want to, Stacey. I don't want to. <laughs> right. So, um, so yeah, so your kids are hard and they – they should be hard, but it's a great opportunity for us to look at our our window of tolerance emotion because it is so much easier to 
um, placate our child and be, make them feel better right away, which I still do a lot, um, I admit. Mm-hmm. But because of seeing her upset and seeing her sad and having to consciously sit with her when she's crying and, you know, talk to her, even though she's two years old, and kind of asking her what she needs, how she feels, and just sitting with her in the sadness, rather than grabbing a cookie and saying, here you go. And crying <laughs> if I do that. <laughs> Oh, you are poking me at all the feels today, girlfriend, because, okay, if you, I, you know, I'm an Enneagram nut. And so I'm a strong type seven on the Enneagram, which I like to like liken to that dog from Up, oh, the yes. movie Up, Pixar. Yeah. <laughs> like, just, we are the best at cognitive reframes, like the apocalypse could be going down around us. And I'll be like, there's a silver lining in this. Stop focusing on the <laughs> shit. And so... With my daughters, it's not always so much about placating, but it's like I don't, if I'm not careful, I don't have a tolerance for it. I was like, this is stupid. Why are you (laughs) crying over this? (laughs) It's not in a like, you don't get to. It's just like, why would you want to? (laughs) Like, come on. So that was very good reminder. Thank you for that. (laughs) It's important to allow them their own own process. Like, you'll grow from this. (laughs) Oh, bless it. Bless it all. So what are some of the ways that you help clients empower themselves by being okay with having to work through trauma, even though they don't want to call it right. that? So, so yeah, so I think kind of earlier on, it's maybe even figuring out what these things are, especially the stuff that might not be as obvious. When people have big T traumas, it's a lot more obvious. But even when people have big T traumas, they also likely have little T trauma. So it's kind of like working our way to the other underlying things. So I really go off my clients a lot and I tell them whatever they're ready for. So sometimes, especially if they have a lot of big T traumas, they might not feel in an empowered place to go there yet. And I'm just always like, that's fine. You know, like you have your whole life (laughs) Um, and we can work on whatever you need to now. And I think giving them that permission that they can do it when they're ready in and of itself is empowering, if that makes sense. And because we just kind of slow it down a little bit and then and we we Mm -hmm. work on calming skills and maybe smaller goals And I think that helps um, build some of that empowerment of saying, you know what, I think I can go there now. You know, I love that. I often tell my clients, it's like you have spent so many years likely, you know, putting that trauma, whatever it is that upset you in a box, duct taped over and over in the back of the closet of your psyche. I, I promise you there's plenty to unpack. I don't need to go right for that box that you have so carefully, you know, put barbed wire around, you know, we don't have to relive it. Yeah. And I'm glad you said that. Cause another thing I do is I look and I help my clients see the benefit of having barbed wire around that box that's duct taped and uh-huh. et cetera. Like there's a reason why it's like that because you needed to do that. You as in, you know, my client, whoever um, needed to do that to survive at one time. Like that's what you mm-hmm. had to do. So Mm-hmm. Don't shame yourself or blame yourself for like, why can't I go there? It's like your system set up all of these walls so that you won't go there because at that time it was unsafe. Amen. And I think our field sometimes gets shit on, at least, you know, certain trolls on my business, Tales from a Trapezoid page, like to accuse us of this at times of, you know, staying only in the past. The therapist only focus on your past. And I and I know that hands down from working alongside, you know, trauma therapists such as yourselves, really more what we're concerned about is how your past is informing your present yes. moment now. And so well, I don't care if it's big T trauma, little T trauma. Number one, I think we both agreed on shit has right. happened to all of us. Get the fuck over it. <laughs> Work on normalizing it. And number two, recognizing how it's affecting you. You know, those patterns you seem to be dating loser after loser after loser. You seem to be going to bed crying every single night because you're a terrible mama. Like, it's 
It is affecting you now, and we don't have to rush straight into that barbed wire fence, but we can hold it, you know, with love and space for what it did for us and work on it here in the present moment. So I don't know. I just had to get on that soapbox. No, and I'm glad you did because it's it's very true. And I've even seen things because I have um, a blog on or a blog post on my blog that it's I think it's titled. Um, something like what to do if you're feeling worse after your therapy session. And yeah, and I get so much traffic on that page and people commenting about their stories and how they're never going to see a therapist ever again because they... um, (laughs) I'm not laughing at their pain. I'm just laughing because it's so normal, but if they don't push through it. Yeah, and it's like, and I... You know, and I'm glad I wrote this post, but it does tear me up emotionally sometimes listening, um, reading these Mm -hmm. stories. And um, because, I, yeah, I think if we're not careful as therapists about going about that box and not just going in and, you know, ripping it open and saying, here, look what's inside. um, We have to be careful not to do that. And it is scary because, you know, not all therapists do function with, Um, some of that knowledge around it, which makes sense. I think there's a lot more around that trauma informed care now. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think in the past, Mm -hmm. it hasn't been as well integrated into um, trainings and so forth. So, yeah. You're so right. And I, another slight, I love this episode because we're going on to so many beautiful tangents on, on trauma that I think this is also where it's really helpful to find the therapist client fit. You talk about this as well in your blog. And I will link to that particular one in the show notes because I know everyone's going to want to rush and read that one because it does happen a lot. But on the clinician side of it, if I can speak to all the other coaches and healers and counselors listening right now, I think this is where it's really helpful to know your zone of genius and to know where this is where that present minded awareness that you were talking about before with distress tolerance is really, really important. And while I happen to work with like spiritual and sexual abuse. There's a lot of other traumas, not my bag. And because I'm a strong type seven on the Enneagram and so big into empowerment, we can call it, blame it on whatever. I don't do well with Mm long-term depressives. I don't. And I have amazing colleagues that I refer out to. Now you anxious? Girl, I got you all day long. (laughs) That heavy, like, the high media, that's, it's not my zone of genius. And I need, I am very careful because I think it's best practice to refer out to other clinicians that can hold that sacred space in love and compassion right. longer than I yes. can. Yes, yes, yeah, um, because we need to be in that place. Otherwise, when we're feeling drained or stuck you know, with a client, then we are more apt to maybe make sense or try to push things further along for our benefit instead of our clients. And um, so it's good to know what we're most comfortable with so that we don't get into those uncomfortable places because that's where and then it's an attachment breach between the clinician and the client which then triggers attachment breach from childhood and and it does make feel worse elsewhere oh (laughs) for sure yeah oh so good the the other thing that struck me while you were talking is the you know it's almost an informed consent risk that i I think all smart clinicians do get into is that therapy doesn't always feel good. As much as I love the cognitive reframing empowered sessions, there are days where, yes, we do have to unpack that wound. It's getting gangrenous and it's like, I can't leave you with this thing pussing and oozing all over. Um, Sometimes we have to lance it with love. And I describe it to my clients as like, there are some days that we're raising this shit up to the surface, right? I'm stirring the shit pot. And now all of that crap is kind of, that you've worked so hard floating, you know, stuff down is floating to the surface. And you've got to hang in there with me long enough to be able yes. to skim it off. Yes. And, um, and it's scary. So I talk to my clients a lot about it. You know, yeah, a lot of stuff came up. You know, your brain's probably going to continue processing some of this between now and next session. If you need to call me, please do. I make sure they have a lot of those skills online to come. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't go into that stuff until I know they have the skills and they feel confident having the skills. Because, yeah, some days you are going to leave and you're going to feel pretty crappy. But, yeah, it's all a part of the process. 
Yeah, and hopefully it's crappy in a good way. Like you just had a really but, good workout and yeah. you're sore. You're going to be sore the next day, but I you're glad you did it. I love that analogy and I'm going to use it if you don't. Why are you using it? Because I <laughs> also it. work out too. And I'm and because it's like determining the distinction between with workouts being sore or pain, injury. And it took mm-hmm. so much of me learning my body to know the difference. And I'm laughing because it seems silly. No, so true. Girl, and your your posts are inspiring you, bitch. Like I see them and I'm like, oh, now I want to run, but I don't want to run. <laughs> uh, it, it's helpful that when I do my workouts, the my like trainer guy, he takes pictures. So whoever, whoever you're working out, yeah. just have him take pictures and it makes sense. You look like a freaking <laughs> magazine ad. <laughs> I'm like, damn, Stacy, way to yeah, go. Good. And so yeah, good. so that sore, I love that sore feeling, but we don't want pain feeling after our workout. And so it's the same thing in, in therapy. We might we might want there to be some rawness that's there, but we also don't want it to be debilitating. So it's learning how to ride that line. Ride the wave. And I want to turn the dial up even further. Girl, I'm so glad that you are ballsy like I am because <laughs> we, we are not no. just putting around anything. That is such a good analogy for also life. And I really want to throw this in listeners' laps right now of, you know, look at your life and look at your choices. There is a big difference between having uncomfortable scenarios in a relationship versus sitting there and allowing someone mm-hmm. to repeatedly yes, hurt you. But yes, I like how you connected that. Right. Because <laughs> with my daughters, yes, I am working on being comfortable with the shit that they sometimes get stressed out over that I'm going, really? <laughs> what? And it is uncomfortable for me. And I have to check myself so that I don't, you know, rush off and escape or, you know, shut down their process versus continuing to put up mm-hmm. with shit that is hurting you. It's beyond just a good workout. Right. You're sore. Yeah, like I'm in pain. I'm injured. But yeah, I'm still running or something. Yeah, we don't want that in in relationships, yes. um, jobs, uh, everything. Stop justifying the shit for yourself, please. And then you wonder why you're you're having traumatized reactions afterwards. And it's like, no, duh, it doesn't even take a PhD right. in psychology. And I think that ties back a lot to, I'm guessing what you see with clients who have wounds from, you know, spirituality and religion growing up, mm-hmm. of, you know, um, you know, do uh, more of that authority um or authoritarian thanks Very. style you know parenting growing up or within you know a, a church or something of just being subordinate listening to what I say and so it doesn't matter so you learn at a young age if you're in those environments to uh, quote not complain um and just put mm-hmm. up with it when it's real that that's pain not the therapeutic rawness <laughs> and yeah and right. and that's the stuff that you end up having to dig up in therapy um and healing so yeah I'm glad I like how you tied that back around and sometimes it even takes several months of having a therapist or a coach or somebody outside of the situation be like uh-uh mm, nope that's right. not normal <laughs> nope <laughs> that's I am so sorry that you've had to put up with this for so long, but no, that's really not okay. Like that's gaslighting. Like you're, you're not crazy. They're turning the gas down. No. Yeah. And if you know, in your life, that's what you're used to experiencing, you know, you, it makes sense that you think that's normal and that's just how life is. That's how people are. And then you expect it and then you tolerate it. And so yeah, that's where having great supports, and being vulnerable and sharing some stuff about, you know, what's going on with you so that people can give that, that, um, like you're saying, that viewpoint of, mm, that doesn't sound healthy. And I don't think you have to tolerate that or deal with that. Yeah, it's been really fascinating and enlightening and saddening and all of the emotions to watch the traumatized brain in action and learn to justify and explain away their own feelings. And I think that's one of the biggest indicators I see in clients who have gone through things that that no person Mm -hmm. was meant to go through is when they have no connection to their intuition. And so they are in pain and their their pain threshold is Mm -hmm. way too high. Yeah. 
And I'm like, no, no, baby. <laughs> this is why you're screaming out for an epidural. Like, this is get out. Yeah. Yeah. And that's part of, um, I do a dissociative questionnaire. And, you know, one of the questions is about that pain. You know, you sometimes find that it's easy to ignore pain. And, um, you know, usually the more dissociative you are, the easier that is because we're just used to tucking that away and storing it somewhere else. But what I found or, My view on things is those things pop up at some point in life and it's better to deal with them than to keep them shut away because it's, I use the cup overflowing analogy, you know, the cup's going to overflow at some point. So we need to empty this and clean it out. (laughs) Amen. And depending upon the person, you might find yourself eating a whole (laughs) sleeve of Oreos or one that stands with people that you're like, oh, the next day, I don't know how I ended up here <laughs> or, you know, in dead end jobs, it will pop right. up somewhere. Exactly. <laughs> so paying attention to your pain, I think it's it's a beautiful adaptive mechanism. Like you were saying earlier, there's a reason that we evolved or were created, whatever your worldview, to have this biofeedback system yeah. within us. Yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah, it's beautiful, it's ingenious, and we learn to do it as little people <laughs> on this earth. And um, yeah. so that's also why unpacking all of the stuff from earlier, I think, is so helpful because that's when we started to store those things away of oh, my feelings don't matter, or I shouldn't feel like that. Because we all learn that when we're little. We don't learn that when we're 30 years old. (laughs) Yes. And I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but I find a lot of times clients will come in and they have no idea what they should be feeling. And they'll, they'll say, They'll be like, Tamara, I, like, I, I had an anxious moment. And I'm yes. like, so fucking what? <laughs> like, <laughs> all the time. <laughs> why, right. Why is that not normal? You know, or, oh, I had a crying spell today. And I think it's really important. I think our culture has gotten so, <laughs> I am stepping on toes here, but we're so like almost like hedonistic <laughs> to the point where. Where if I'm in pain, then there's a there's a problem. My life's not working out the way it's supposed to. And so I think there's a flip side of this that we should explore with people. And I think therapists have an incredible calling of helping normalize yes. people's experience. Yeah. And and kind of back to like the authenticity thing is I, you know, that's where I use myself and you know, and I make jokes and, you know, like, well, I, you know, I feel like that, you know, or I do this or I usually make some up. So like, I'll tell a little story or something or something, make fun of my, I love it. Right. Yeah. And it's usually, you know, nothing, nothing long, crazy, but usually just some little silly thing that, um, and I've even had clients, they're like, they, they so appreciate that so much, especially, you know, the perfectionistic, you know, characteristic types of, and I'll make like a joke, oh, you know, like, yeah, doing this because, yeah, you know, I avoid things and kind of being like, oh, yeah, it's good to remember you're a person and you avoid things, too, or you get anxious, too, or like, we're all just human beings. Seriously. <laughs> Personally, I just don't think you can learn from someone that you can't relate to. And I think therapists as a whole were given a bunch of bullshit in the 80s and 90s and even early 2000s of this whole like being the expert, this whitewashed doctor in the room that nobody can relate to because you were perfect and you had all the answers and the client didn't get to know anything about you. And like you said, there's a fine line. I'm not telling you about my personal sex life, but I am telling you that, yes, I have yeah. anxious moments. Yeah. Like you and do. it's just, and I think that alone is healing. And I think my vision is I would like the world to be like that. I would like just everybody to be like that. And not, I think there'll always be a place for therapy and therapists, but it makes me so sad when like your therapist is the only person that you feel you can get the reactions that that are healing and the understanding and the lack of judgment. It's like, you really, we we're a society now where you have to pay someone just to like feel validated. (laughs) (laughs) Good point. Touche. Yeah. So Yeah. I've actually heard from clients that therapy was the first place that they'd ever gotten an apology Mm -hmm. either. And I just think, wow, that's so sad. 
that I'm, I'm the first person that's ever said, I'm sorry you had to go through that. Or when something, when I did have a genuine mess up, which is hard for me <laughs> as being a strong type A perfectionist. Going, uh, uh, I remember, I will never live this down. I called a wife by her husband's girlfriend's name. I just, terrible, terrible, mortifying moment. But being able to, it was corrective for both of us, for me to just re- quickly own it in the moment and say, I am so sorry. I was so anxious about doing that, that I actually did that please forgive me. And, you know, for her not having people put her needs first and apologize was a big moment for her. Yeah. And that's helpful reminders too for therapists that you don't have to be perfect because there is actually healing in us being imperfect. So, um, yeah, that's a good point. (laughs) Sister friend. (laughs) Oh, so as we start to wrap up, if you could speak to, you know, both every therapist listening and then on also every man or woman who is struggling to figure out what's authentic to them, Mm. what would you say? So as far as therapists go, kind of like what we were talking about earlier, being yourself and allowing your clients to see yourself and being okay with the fact that some clients aren't going to resonate with who that person is, and that's fine, but you're going to get the people that do resonate and your clients are going to be so thankful, like so thankful. And Mm -hmm. since I had changed, you know, since I had my web copy well, and I've been getting those clients and um, I can like feel the relief in the room when my clients are able to fully be themselves because they know that resonates with me and I can be with them at that level. So that's, (laughs) <laughs> for therapists Love it. and as far as like every you know man and women and and I work I know you tend to work I think a lot with females right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. well it depends upon the issue I talk more about females because I don't know men don't often <laughs> like to talk about them having issues I work a, a lot of my male clients are either high profile anxious like CEOs or or like going through existential crisis or they've got um, sex therapy yeah, issues. Yeah, I was a little so. curious because I work, yeah, yeah. It, cause I work a lot. I, I want to say it's pretty close to 50-50 with men and women, which is actually unusual because that hmm. that ratio is really is high unusual. in the male range. So, mm-hmm. and I think it has to do with my sarcasm and swearing and <laughs> things like that. But um, so, so, yeah, so I guess anyone listening, I guess I... I almost feel like I want to put out a challenge. I don't know if this is helpful. <laughs> Do it. Like Do I'd it. like to challenge yes. um, people listening to allow themselves to go there um, inside and do the work, uncover the shit. And if you're thinking, I don't have any shit, like you're the person that I want you to channel. Like, you're the, you're the one that I'm challenging. <laughs> so like, go look at it and find out what it is. And... I guess I want to say, like, I think you'd be surprised as to how much that stuff is popping up into the areas of life that you're not really happy in. So, if, yeah, yeah. I love that. Can sure. I put you on the hot seat for a quick second then and say, what is something that you've been surprised Ooh, to learn about yourself? that's a good question. Um, hmm. Oh, surprise, because I think there's some things that I've known about myself and it's just been like admitting that. Yes. And I, you just came back from a retreat. So I'm sure there's all sorts of goodness in there. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, that's good. Cause the retreat was really helpful. So I think even getting to the point of like going on a retreat like that, that I knew it would have its own um, snippets of working on my healing and things like that. Like I know me years ago would have been like, I don't need anything like mm-hmm. that. I'm fine. Um, because I was that person that I remember being in grad school, like basically to tears and frustration at my professor saying, I don't know what you want me to write about. My childhood was fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, girl. <laughs> because there's so much. And that's what you do in grad school. It's all self reflection It's like running your soul through um, a cheese grater. <laughs> Swear to God. <laughs> right? So it's like I almost felt like I was like trying to like come up yeah. with shit. And, and it's like I wanted someone to shake me in that moment of just like Stacey, relax into it. And even if it doesn't make sense, you know, um, even if 
your anxiety, you're not, you know, in the hospital because your anxiety doesn't mean that you can't explore the anxiety that you do have or, you know, all that stuff. It's like, I almost felt like things had to be either severe or if they weren't severe, that means it wasn't a problem. So I feel like I'm getting off on no, a tangent. You're not. Anyway. I, I love it because it really speaks to the idea that and therapists hate this. We have a love hate relationship with this. I can see that story all over your website. I can see it mm. in what you're passionate about. And I actually think that it's the most beautiful part of being a healer. I think it gets shit on the whole. We work with what we know, but I think that's the best way because again, you can't work. I can't learn truly transformationally from someone who hasn't been there. If you're not a parent, it, I, you know, I'm not saying there's not value in working with a therapist that has read all the parenting books and is ABA certified. But for me personally, mm-hmm. it just means so much more to talk to another mom therapist, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, so I think it's so important and, um, and the retreat was great. I allowed myself to be open and, um, and I really loved the, uh, it's, you know, the practice of being seen, you know, with Rebecca and Marisa. And, and that's what I felt. I felt seen, but I didn't feel seen in the ways that I'm usually seen. Like when I'm seen, I'm usually worried more about like, uh, someone criticizing me or pointing out how I look or being seen in those ways. I don't feel good, but the ways the other therapists there just kind of reflected things about my personality because they were just learning me. I'm like, I feel seen in like a really loving and connectful way. And that was, I guess I wanted to say like, that was like one of, that's something I learned about myself was I didn't realize how much I wanted that or needed that until I guess I opened myself up and was in an environment that I felt safe to do that. You didn't know it till you had it. I think that's so beautiful. Yes. (laughs) And I really see, I want to honor you for that because I see that as being one of your strongest spiritual and therapeutic gifts for clients is that you help them see their own stuck places. We don't have to call them traumas. And and you yeah. make it okay. Mm-hmm. You normalize it and you give them the space to give voice to it and, you know, re-empower themselves with it. Mm-hmm. I Definitely. love that about you. Yeah. I'm so glad you you exist. <laughs> <You're here. laughs> I'm glad you exist too. <laughs> oh, girl crush. Stacey, thank, you. thank you so much for today's conversation. Thank you. It was wonderful. Where can people connect with you? Because besides the blog that I'm going to put in the show notes. Where's a great, where do you tend to hang out? Where do, oh, I hang out mainly on Facebook, which is a problem that I need to work on. Um, but I, yeah, so I have my business page. I usually try and blog. I put up a blog usually weekly for the most part on there. And I do shoot it out to Twitter. Oh, I'm on Instagram too. No one really follows me. I'm Change Warrior on Instagram. Ooh, I love that name. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so I do all the social, I'll throw my blog out everywhere, but the easier social media means that I'm on the most are my Facebook business page and Instagram and on obviously my website, ASCounseling.com, which is getting a facelift and I'm so excited. (laughs) It's already got me swooning, so I can't even wait to see what's going to happen next. Yeah. We'll just look a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, doll. Thank you again. All right. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Undressing the Spirit podcast. I pray you found some inspiration and titillation today. As always, I am forever grateful for five-star reviews, comments, and subscriptions on iTunes and anywhere else you may be listening to this broadcast. Please note the information provided is not meant to convey professional, psychological, or medical advice. If you could use such services, I highly recommend seeking them out from someone you trust. To get in touch with me personally, please check out ariatherapy.com or talesfromatrapezoid.com. Until next time, everyone.